This is Michael Cowan, and welcome to Trial Lawyer Nation. He helps us pan for the gold inside ourselves. You need to have grit. I mean, a lot of this is grit. I feel like I've been made a better lawyer. They're talking about something that's real to them. You have to be really careful not to be Goliath. They saved a bunch of lives and changed society forever. But let's just begin the conversation. Welcome to Trial Lawyer Nation, your source for guidance to win bigger verdicts, get more cases, and manage your practice. And now, here's your host, noteworthy author, sought-after speaker, and renowned trial lawyer, Michael Cowan. Today on the show, we have attorney Steve Gersten. Steve's a good friend of mine, and he owns a firm called Michigan Auto Law, uh, Michigan's largest firm handling truck, car, and motorcycle accident cases. He's had the top settlement of verdict in the state of Michigan for an auto or truck case eight of the last 12 years. He's also the past chair of the Trucking Litigation Group for AAJ and the chair-elect of the Traumatic Brain Injury Group. He is a great lawyer, gets great results. At the same time, he's running a multiple law firm, uh, which gives him a lot of experience in the business side of running a law firm. So I wanted to have him on the show uh, because he can talk about all kinds of things that are really useful from handling brain injury cases to building your law practice and to having great customer service uh, so that your law practice can prosper and continue to be good and tips for anyone that aspires to be a great trial lawyer. I hope you enjoy it. So Steve, tell me a little bit about yourself. Well, um, I am 48 years old. I am the, um, I guess, the main trial attorney at my, my main law firm, which is Michigan Auto Law. And um, in the last several years, because I'm, I'm, I've been concerned about becoming obsolete with technology being put in cars today, I've also um, started and, and now uh, run uh, three other law firms as well. Oh, wow. What, what are those? So one is uh, what has become the number one workers' comp law firm in Michigan, uh, because I, I figured even if there are no longer car accidents one day, there will still be people who have jobs, and unfortunately, they'll probably still get hurt on the job. Um, with a couple good friends, uh, Michael Leeserman and Joe Freed, uh, um, we started a national trucking law firm. And um, that was something just we developed really from really, you know, we, we would speak at seminars all over the country. We, we became really good friends over the last 15 years uh, from kind of being on the truck speaking circuit together. And we thought, you know what, we, we've been meeting informally for, for years and years, focus grouping our cases and working on them together. And we used to call it round tabling the cases and they would like one year they came to uh, Michigan and we, we camped out at a great deli called Zingerman's in Ann Arbor and we would round table our best cases. And from that we decided to, uh, we came up with the name of the law firm and called it the truck accident attorneys round table. And the whole idea was that it was going to be the three of us working together on these cases as good friends and, and really just having fun in the practice area. And for me, uh, it's fun because it gets me out of Michigan, which is just a, a, a state that's really been hammered by tort reform and gets me in other states that have, you know, interesting different areas of law um, where I can do things like life care plans and have punitive damages that we don't really have available to us in Michigan. So it's it's fun and it's an intellectual challenge. And then um, I found what I think is an area of law. Um, a couple of years ago, I found an area of law that really doesn't have a lot of competition out there, uh, but where the cases can be, unfortunately, very catastrophic. Um, And I went out and researched it, and I found the lawyer that really is the top lawyer in the country doing this area of law, and uh, we decided to partner up. um, And now we have a a fourth venture together. So it's, it's been a lot of fun. I want to hear a little about your story about how you got, you're my age, you know, how you got from a dude graduating from law school to you know, getting all these big settlements and verdicts and running multiple law firms? So, you know, um, I'm very fortunate. Um, I, I had a lot of success very early on, and it really changed my career. Um, I don't know if you ever read the book Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell, yeah. but one of my favorite books, and he always talks about being in the right place at the right time. And, and I really think that's what happened to me because I graduated law school um, right when the mist uh, minimal impact, soft tissue, all state, zero offers was a really big thing. And the reality is for an entire generation before when when I came out, everything settled. 
everything was going into arbitration or lawyers would settle on the phone with adjusters. No one really knew how to try cases anymore, like for an entire lost generation. And I come out and I'm working at a law firm where all of a sudden we've got a lot of cases where there are zero offers. And for me as a baby lawyer, it was the best thing that ever happened. I tried my first case, I think literally two months after I passed the bar. And um, I'm the youngest lawyer in Michigan history to get a million dollar verdict. Wow. Um, a year later, on a on basically it was a zero offer, soft tissue case with Allstate. So I'm a I'm this baby lawyer with a million dollar verdict in in a conservative county called Oakland, and what happened was from there, all these lawyers who had zero offers started wanting to refer me their soft tissue cases, and I got a lot of trial experience, um, really getting a full um, kind of drop cases, you know, the, the hot grounders ready for trial. From other lawyers and um, it was the best gift in the world because my, my early years I had more trials than, than most lawyers will have in an entire career these days. Um, from there uh, about two years later I got a, a, a four million dollar plus verdict on a brain injury case and all of a sudden people wanted to start referring me their brain injury work. A lot more fun than the, than the soft issue. A lot more <laughs> a lot more fun and a lot more interesting but um, and, and that was how I thought I wanted my career to go. So the first 10 years of my practice, um, you know, I, I always joke and call it like the, the Soviet five-year plan, you know? Yeah. And, and I literally, um, you know, my goal was I wanted to be a great trial lawyer and have lawyers all over the state refer me cases for trial. And I would, you know, and, and I would say this to any young lawyer, I actually uh, talk and lecture in a number of law schools in Michigan. Um, you know, every day I was making sure that I was taking 30 minutes to an hour to to read and study some area of law. So, you know, Monday might be opening statements, Tuesday's cross-exam, Wednesday closing, Thursday medicine, you know, learning all about herniations and brain injury. Because if there's one mistake most PI lawyers make is they don't understand the underlying medicine. And, and I'm so amazed by that, how they try to you know, they try to just fly by the seat of their pants, and they never study the underlying medicine, uh, and it's exasperating. But I really wanted to be an expert in the medicine. Absolutely. I got blessed when I was a young associate. The lawyer I was with was writing a book with a neurosurgeon called The Legal Spine, and one of my jobs was to proofread each chapter as it was written. It's and so gift. I got a big, it's and a plus the gift. neurosurgeon would be in the office on a regular basis, and I can run. Now he was really conservative. Uh, but I learned a lot. It's a great way to learn. It really was. And, you know, along those lines, I used to take tons of discovery depositions of defense doctors, and I would ask them nothing about the case. I'd just ask them basic questions about medicine. And it's amazing how much you can learn. And I, I built a great database. And, and then Fridays, I wanted to be an expert on the Michigan no-fault law. And, and that's, how I, that's how I did it for the first five to ten years of my practice. And if you look at my office, I've got giant red ropes on each area of law, you know, each phase of trial, the medicine. I've got, you know, literally multi-briefcases full of peer-reviewed journal articles on all sorts of issues with brain injury and discs and everything else. And um, Now, back when you were taking the time to go study like 30 minutes per hour a day yeah. in a different area, what was your caseload like back then? Brutal. <laughs> Listen, I, I'm not going to lie. Because I, I started, I, you know, I started similar to you. I, I tried a lot. I was trying eight to fifteen soft tissue, low impact or low property damage cases per year, running over two hundred cases without an associate uh, for the first, you know, eight ten years that I was out on my own. And uh, you know, the study time I did, but it it was nice weekends. I mean, how did you do it? Yeah, and, and it's funny because. Um, so I, I would make sure normally the first half hour to hour of the day when I was fresh, before the phones would start ringing, that would be my time. Or the or if I had to, the very end of the day. Um, but that was my practice too. And, and we never did any marketing. Um, I didn't know anything about marketing. I was a poli-sci and history and economics major at U of M, um, University of Michigan. But um, any marketing I would do would normally be from 11 p.m. to, to midnight, you know, wow. <laughs> you know and, and then the next day you'd start all over again. And for the first 10, 15 years of my career, it was 250 cases with an uh, associate attorney and two paralegals working six to seven days a week like, like we do. And, you know, and, and I was happy. Um, but honestly, as I got a little bit older, I started to think how sustainable was that? And I also, I, you know what, I always was a little 
concerned about being at the mercy when your entire practice is based on lawyer referrals um, of being at the mercy of others and you know the you know the kindness of strangers as they say in the streetcar <laughs> named desire and um, I felt at some point it was more important to start taking control more control of my own destiny and decided basically to start teaching myself a little bit more about how to run a law firm and, and marketing. And I literally taught myself the internet and digital marketing. And it, it has transformed our practice today where, you know, I still get a, a majority of my cases are still lawyer referrals from all over the state and, and now all over the country that for cases that occur in Michigan. But a huge part of our, um, our practice is based on internet cases because I was an early adapter and and taught myself the internet and um, we built a a very successful website and that's changed everything so we went from originally four lawyers uh, believe it or not to now we have 20 and I'm kicking and screaming because I don't want to hire anymore but we keep getting really good cases coming yeah. in and it's a it's a nice problem to have it is it's something I've struggled with and uh, I mean you and I have this in common too that we both run law firms but still want to try cases right uh, and they're really two very different disciplines. So how do you find the time to run your firm right, make sure those other 19 lawyers are doing it the way you need it done, but still getting into a case well enough to try it? So the first thing you have to, you have to be realistic. And, you know, if I'm running four law firms and I'm in charge of all the marketing, because at the end of the day, the buck stops with me and, and I'm the owner. You have to, you know, and one thing I do feel very strongly about is just like with your health, just like with your finances, you have to take ownership of, of your marketing, just like you do all the other areas of your life. You, you can hire great people. You know, for example, you have Delisi, and, and you know, if, you, if you hire great people, they'll make your life a lot easier. They do. But at the end of the day, it's still your name you know, on that law firm, and you have to take ownership of your future. So um, I don't want to discount that. But it means you have to be realistic. So I've gone from 250 cases to now I've got 15 cases. And to be honest, each one of them is seven to eight figures. And, and it you know, allows me to spend my time and really work them to the hilt. But I don't really handle 100 policies anymore or 250 policies. I've got 19 other really good lawyers in my office that I can delegate to. And I've, I've, I'm a huge believer in systems. Um, there's a great book called The, the E-Myth yeah. and The E-Myth Revisited that I, I think any lawyer needs to read and understand. Um, and I have created... So it's funny. Taking a step back, I believe building a case is a system that, that you really have checklists you can follow. You really have almost like an if-then flowchart type analysis that leads you to make sure that, that injuries are not going undocumented um, you know, and we can talk more about that, how we do it, but we have the systems in place, um, very much similar to the, the book, The Checklist Manifesto, because if you're busy and your phones are ringing 30 times a day and you've got 300 emails, you're going to miss things. You're not going to be able to think critically and things will fall through the cracks. So we literally have, um, in our case management software, we have drop downs that, you know, basically if someone, let's say, has a brain injury, it cues us, all right, have we considered referrals to, for example, a neurologist, a neuropsychologist, and for diagnostic testing of the brain, like a diffuse tensor image? So you have to have those types of, of systems in place so that you can not only be on top of your cases, but to make sure that you don't blink your eyes and six months pass and they die on the vine which is really what happens when you're a busy litigator. Absolutely. But what system do you use out of curiosity? Well, we've used needles. Uh -huh. um, I, I don't want to give a plug to needles because we're leaving them. Okay. Because <laughs> they've been lying to me for 10 straight years saying that these great changes are coming around the corner. I they haven't. Yeah, <laughs> so so we're, we're very frustrated needles users. Um, I don't mind saying that on your podcast. I'm, an, I'm, an, I'm still a needles user. So Well, we're looking at a couple other options right now, but we have a great document management system. We're a paperless office. Um, we really believe in technology, and um, you know. So, so what I was saying though a moment ago is, is the first six to eight months of the case really can be system driven, um, making sure that that you're you have systems in place to delight your clients and have great customer service 
which is hugely important, and, and I, I can't emphasize that enough. That is, if there's one thing that's going to make law different today than, than at any other time, it's the fact for the first time ever, good lawyers get rewarded and bad lawyers are going to get punished. So for the first time ever, we have things like Google reviews and Avo and Yelp. And, and if you can delight your clients with, with great customer service, then, then you are going to be rewarded by the search engines. And um, those can be system-based. So, for example, we have a dashboard system, and I'm making sure that every lawyer is calling my clients at least minimum once a month. And that's hugely important. Now, there's, there's like I said, I was... At least he's smiling because we have the same thing at our office, and we have big fights with people saying, well, I'm so busy. It's like, if you're too busy to call your client once a month, if you're too busy to do a full case review once a month, exactly. then you have too many cases, and you know you need to make a choice. Do you want to... If you want to make the money on these cases, then you need to spend the time to work your files and keep your clients up to date because, you know, people don't hire us to have their cases just sitting in a box somewhere. And, and this is the difference from good lawyers and, and bad lawyers because for a good lawyer, there's always more to do. You're never done. There's always more to do. And there's, if you're not talking to your client and, and identifying early on the red flags, the holes, the, the little things that if you catch it early, they're not going to become case killers. They're not going to cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars on the case. Social media, you know, what, what they're posting on Facebook, uh, the fact that you blink your eyes and they haven't been back to the doctor in four months because you didn't talk to them. Or they went to a different doctor and never told you, and that doctor does mostly insurance defense work. Like, you you really have to stay on top of them. But um, it, it comes back to me, there is um, there is a, an economist, a very famous Hungarian economist whose name was Tibor Sotowski. And there is a paper he wrote that really changed it for me because what he said is lay people cannot properly evaluate professional services like law, like lawyers and because they have nothing to compare it to. So if you've got someone with a rotator cuff injury, they don't they have no idea what that case is worth, whether it's eighty thousand or twenty thousand or eight hundred thousand. And they're basing in the entirety whether they had a great experience with your law firm based upon the service that you deliver. Did you return phone calls? Did you did you call them back at night? Did you were you sitting next on the deposition and caring and having empathy and rapport? And if you have that, if you if you can deliver Nordstrom's type customer service as a lawyer, then they will be raving fans of your law firm. And if you can do both, if you can get them great results and have great client service, that's the model I think we need to have a really successful law firm in the 21st century. We've even expanded that to the referring lawyer because we, we kind of surveyed our referring lawyers and found that the biggest complaint referring lawyers have was they would send a case to a lawyer and it would fall into a black hole and then one to two years later they would either get a check or they would get an email saying, well, sorry, it didn't work out. Uh, and giving the referring lawyer the regular updates, the contacts, showing them some love, take them to lunch, take them to a concert, you know, whatever it took. Uh, making them happy too, as well as keeping their clients happy when they send them over so they don't have complaints going back. Why'd you send me here? They're not calling me back. Uh, well, one really one problem you have is you're too humble because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak about you for a moment. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, I, I referred to you a, a very serious truck death case in Texas not too long ago. And, and I just want your listeners to know that you were on top of it. You were sending me two page emails the next day. You were dropping everything and going out to meet with the family. And yeah, that is a type of thing that sticks in the mind of a referral lawyer, and you know, it made it made a big impression. That was the intent, <laughs> and and it works. Yeah, I was and, like, this was a big. It was a very big deal to me that that you had that confidence in me, and so I did go out there, and it's a good thing I did because I saw things that were not on the police report, and uh, you know, where the paint, where the, the police report had them had the truck going to a different place, and when we looked at the paint. We very clearly found the case. Well, the confidence was well placed. So thank so you. It's, but but the point is that it was it was also your follow up with me that left such an impression. And you're right; most lawyers don't do that, and it doesn't take that long. Mm -hmm. um, but the fact that you sent me these these really detailed emails laying out what your plan of action was and what you were doing, you know, I've got referrals out to lawyers in you know almost every state in the country, and and very few are doing what you're doing. And trust me, it makes a big impression. Thank you. So what do you, how do you get your other 19 lawyers to, to buy in and stick to your systems? Uh, it, it's culture. And, and I will not lie, culture is probably the hardest thing in the world. 
um, because it's it's like gardening. You're never done, Um, and it is a constant uh, thing to to make sure you're building a great culture. Um, For me, so I I was lucky enough to start practicing with my dad, and it was it was great. But I'll be honest, one thing that that um, lawyers, let's say a generation ago, a lot of lawyers. Um, did was they they were pretty lousy about talking to their own clients, and I've noticed that with a lot of maybe old school lawyers, they really have this destructive belief that they're too good to talk to their own clients. You know that's what I I have a paralegal for, <laughs> and 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 that's something we had to really nip in the bud um, because again, if you're going to be based on attorney referrals and you're going to be an internet law firm, you have to delight people with customer service, and um, there's nothing. And you know this also. I mean, nothing makes someone more unhappy than a lawyer that doesn't return phone calls. Now, most of my cases involve a brain injury component as well. So if you're dealing with people who've got a severe depression component, psychological overlay, or just the fact, the fact they're dealing with chronic pain, and you're not, and their, their lawyer is not returning phone calls, they're going to go crazy. Yeah. And that's when they start calling other lawyers. So, you know, culture begins with you. Again, as the owner, um, it is something I try to instill in in every lawyer that I have. And, um, you know, there are little things we do and there are big things. Um, little things we do is every time we get a great review, um, it goes out to every lawyer, every person in our law firm, because you have to walk the walk, not just talk the talk. So we make sure everybody knows it. This is what we're looking at. This is what's important to us, that we're delighting our clients. Um, it, it also goes to how you treat your own people. If you're going to nickel and dime your staff, then you can't expect that they're going to go the extra mile to treat your clients great. Um, it, it goes with building a culture from the early from early on. So uh, we've had a very successful law clerk mentorship program where I want to say probably nine of my last 11 hires actually started out as law clerks in my office. And I do that because, honestly, I can't find really good lawyers because they all get ruined when they're in practice and they pick <laughs> up really bad habits. But if I could train them early on and I could watch them for two years as a law clerk, I see their work ethic, I see how they get along with people, I see how they get along with clients because they're talking on the phone, they're doing you know updates, making sure we're a no-fault state in Michigan. So it's constant phone work, making sure that no bill gets you know falls through the cracks. But, but you, can, you can see early on, are they people that are going to be people, pe- uh, people, people? Um, I do psychological testing and disc profiles to make sure that they are going to be um, high social and extroverted and, there's, in their, not, and have great follow-through. And I've been amazed at how spot-on really? psychological testing is. I, I'm, I'm constantly amazed by it. I, I go back and I look at the, some of the reports of lawyers I hired 10 years ago. I read it 10 years later, and it's spot-on. It's, it's, really, it's really amazing. <laughs> Um, but but it goes to instilling early on that that the most important part of your job is is having great client rapport and treating these clients like gold. And and again, part of walking the walk is we have an extremely stable law firm. But the lawyers I've let go, I have made sure everybody knows it's because those are lawyers that were not returning phone calls or they weren't on top of their cases. Um, because. It, in a in a world where we were dumb enough to all become lawyers, <laughs> you know, where where the supply is greater than the demand, and arguably the pie keeps shrinking, uh, you better be able to be remarkable and do something to distinguish yourself in your law firm, and that goes with how you treat people and it goes with the results you get. And if you can't, like we do the same thing you do, if you can't look at a case and analyze it once every thirty days, and say here are the to dos, here are the things that that we need to follow up on. Here are the potential red flags. Here's my plan of action. And call the client. And it just needs to be maybe, it could be a two-minute phone call. It could just be, hey, Joe, you know, I, I was working on your case. Just wanted to reach out and say hello. Just just wanted to see how you're feeling. And is there any questions I could answer for you? Um, and they love that. You know, it's funny. Even now, 25 years later, and I'm the head of the firm, I still go into work one Sunday a month. And sometimes it's just for an hour. And I call all my clients, and I just say, hey, you know, I'm in the office just working on your file, and I just want to say hi. And, and do you know what that does? Because they, they tell everybody in the world they know, wow, my lawyer's working on my file <laughs> on a Sunday, and yeah. he called me. And, 
and you know they're putting that stuff on Facebook. Oh, I mean, that's it's, awesome. it's so you're really trying hard to delight your. You know, it's funny. So for clients, you have to delight them with with customer service and 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 really caring, having empathy and rapport. With the attorney referral part of my practice, it you just have to have better results, better settlements than anybody else in your state. So you got to do both. Yeah. So if somebody wants, you know, they're starting out the practice, or maybe they've had it for a long time, and they want to start building these kind of systems and stuff, what are some of the things that you read? Because you're not a business, you didn't come from a business background, doesn't sound like. No, I, I didn't. It was really self-taught. Um, some of my favorite books are uh, Good to Great, um, Checklist Manifesto, E-Myth Revisited, um, books that, that have you start thinking about not just working in your practice, but on your practice. And I know that's a cliche, but that is so important to actually be able to take a step back and critically analyze your systems. Um, we use a consulting company called Vista. We do too. Oh, good. Yeah, <laughs> and and I got to tell you, they've been fantastic. I I was very cynical originally, and just the changes they made in my intake system and dashboard, so I can track every single phone call and know what my conversion rate is. Those have been amazing changes. And so I guess what I'm saying is, you know, part of it is being humble enough to realize you don't know what you don't know. Reaching out to others um, like Vista to have them help you put those systems in place. And then um, part of it is also just, you know, again, taking ownership for it, um, teaching yourself. Um, I do believe in, in, you know, the old saying management by walking around, you know, MBWA. Um, even though I'm the head of the firm and I have 50 employees in, in my main law firm in Michigan Auto Law, I still make sure I'm walking the firm constantly. I still make sure I'm doing mid-year reviews. I, you know, I lose my entire month of December because I am still trying to sit down and have FaceTime with every single person in that law firm. Wow. But if you, again, those are things you need to do as an owner. Um, so, you know, it, it's, I, I love the business aspect just because it's so completely different and I think it's intellectually interesting. Um, I love the marketing aspect because for me, and I think for lawyers like you, we have now a freedom to take control of our destiny that lawyers a generation ago and a generation from now will never have. And again, using the, the outliers you know, example, like we came along at the right place at the right time. You don't have to spend $10 million to compete with the biggest TV advertiser in your venue anymore. You don't have to have you know, the front and back of the yellow pages anymore. You can literally outwork and out-hustle people, and you could outrank them in the SERPs, in the search engines. And, you know, and the one thing I will say is um, the Internet is where everything is going. So, and, and we came along at the right time where we now, you know, I had the professional accomplishments, the, the results that, that gave me weight and authority, and I had the money where, where I could invest aggressively in doing internet marketing and and I I got it. I was young enough to, to see the, the the opportunities that it had that maybe lawyers a little bit older than us couldn't yet see. And for lawyers who are a little bit younger than us, it's too late. So um, again it was it was being at the right place at the right time. And I I have a website that outranks you know, the, the biggest advertisers on the most important keywords, and it works, and it's changed my practice. Well, you're one of the few people I know that actually has made money off the Internet. <laughs> and then law. Most people have just uh, paid a lot of money to different uh, legal marketing companies, and yeah, the I, marketing companies seem to make all the money. Yeah, and that, and, all right, so that, not to get off <laughs> on, a, on a tangent, but the reality is most marketing companies take terrible advantage of us as lawyers. Terrible advantage. They think we're dumb and... You know, they saw this Yellow Pages model that, you know, we throw the most money at them. They make these vague promises and, and you know, and, and we get taken advantage of. So, but what I would say is, look, you know, like we're at the AHA seminar right now and people are going and they're listening to speakers talk on opening statements or a closing argument. And maybe they'll try a case once every three to four years. And they're not spending the time on things that are going to make your phones ring 20 times a day or 50 times a day. And they're not investing the time to, to learn about things that, that can totally transform their practice. And to get the kind of cases that are that 
pay you back for all the work you do. I mean, you, you can, I worked really, really, really hard on my chiropractor only $3,000 medical bills case. And I got some decent results for those cases. But, you know, my return on investment on a death, a burn, a paraplegia has been much higher. And frankly, it feels I've made a bigger difference in someone's life, yes. someone that really needed it. But you have to get those cases. You can be the best lawyer in the world if no one knows to hire you. It doesn't do you any good. Exactly. So so you have to constantly be thinking about how do I, in an ultra-competitive market, and especially now, you know, in the world where, where most markets are dominated by, you know, the 800-pound gorilla TV advertiser, and also in most states, frankly, where, where ambulance chasing um, is is uglier than I've ever seen it, and there's there's a race to the bottom with a legal solicitation and running and, and cappers. Um, how can you make yourself remarkable? But you know the, the the point I was making with the internet is that it's not magic. It's you know most of the 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 world's best experts are writing blogs. It's all out there for free for you to read. And you know if you just spend again thirty minutes here and there reading this stuff. It can change the way you, it can transform your whole life and practice, and it's there for you. You just have to spend the time and, and invest the time in it, yeah. just like you would closing arguments or opening statements or any other area. So I want to kind of move now. We've talked about a lot about the management marketing, and I could talk about that all day. Uh, selfishly, I would like to learn more and more from you on that. Well, it's it's uh, fun. So, <laughs> But I'll, I want to talk a little bit more about the uh, traumatic brain injuries, because you are a chair of the traumatic brain injury group, and we've been doing more and more brain injury litigation on my firm, so I also want to take advantage of having you here uh, and just kind of go through. We've, we've talked a little bit before we started. Um, one thing is that a lot of times the TBIs get missed, and like we're the first, like the doctors are spending 45 seconds with the client. Uh, they're only looking at the, the spinal surgeon is only looking at the spine. The orthopod is only looking at the knee. No one's like even asking them the questions, you know, and then no one's talking to the spouse, whoever lives with them. So do, how, do you, how do you identify these cases? A uh, system based okay. again. Um, but you're right. So, so just taking a step back with TBI. Um, there's literature from Hartledge um, and others that emergency rooms miss 56 to 80% of all TBIs. Um, that's, that's staggering if you think about it. And then um, medicine is broken. You know, it really is because... The way medicine is practiced today, where it is it is defined by specialties and subspecialties and then sub subspecialties, is you don't have anyone taking a holistic look at, at the the patient and, and really going head to toe. I mean, I guess presumably a PMNR might be the closest to that, a physical medicine and rehabilitation doctor, but for most people, by the time they get to one, assuming it's not clearly catastrophic right in the ER, that could be a year and a half to two years down the road. If that, and even they have the pressures with you know the insurance companies are, they're pressuring them, they're cutting what they pay, they're making them where they have to see so many patients a day and not spend the time, exactly. or they go broke. And it's not, exactly. I'm not even really criticizing the doctors because if they don't do it that way, they can't pay their nurses, they can't pay their rent. Right. It, it's a managed care world, and ironically, you know, you've got health insurance companies out there that actually punish doctors for making too many refer referrals or too aggressive on referrals. It actually affects their bottom line. So they yeah. have a financial disincentive. So like just like with everything else, now it, it comes back to you and you have to take ownership of it. So um, one of the things we do that really helps is from day one, and day one, um, when we get a phone call, whenever that phone call is, we really try to make sure there is someone meeting with that client within 24 hours. And, and that's because, frankly, there's lawyers coming out of the woodwork these days trying to steal those cases. Um, but as part of the, the, the meet um, with the client, we have in our, in our package something called the Philadelphia Head Injury Questionnaire. It's a very simple, short uh, questionnaire that you could download right off the Internet. But it's very, very good at giving you a pretty good idea of whether there was a brain injury or not. And when the lawyer then gets that file back and is reviewing it, we make sure to mark in the computer that this is a case where it looks like there may be a possible brain injury. And as part of that, then, we are trying to make sure um, that if they have continuing symptoms, such as headaches, 
uh, problems with memory, concentration, personality changes, irritability, what have you, that we are trying to get them, a, and we try not to do the direct referrals, because that, that's, that can be death. To be honest, you, yeah. as a lawyer, you don't want to be making those direct referrals, but try to make sure that they are at least getting the help they need for the problems that they are having, and they're not going undiagnosed and untreated. So, and, and it's a real challenge because, again, going back to our managed care world, you know, health insurance companies, you know, it could, it could take a family doctor eight months to a year before they'll even make a referral to a neurologist for traumatic headaches. And you're trying to get a, a workup early on because the literature is very clear. If they can get treatment early, the, the chances of a good recovery are, are so much better than it would be, you know, later on. It also helps us legally because you then avoid that big delay, that big gap right. in, in you know, when this was diagnosed. But we try to make sure that, that we're talking to the clients again, that we're saying, okay, if you're still having headaches, for example, that are a 10 out of 10, where you're having to turn down the lights and, and loud noises are bothering you, will you please make sure when you see your family doctor next Tuesday to tell them that you've been talking to others, you're really concerned that you're having 10 out of 10 headaches on a pain scale, and you've been told that, that maybe you should see a neurologist, and can they write a referral? And we do things like that, um, and there, there are a dozen ways to do this, but you know, if they're having problems with memory and concentration, we're trying to make sure they're getting to the neuropsychologist. I, I am a believer in neuropsychology still. There are a lot of great brain injury lawyers that don't use them. I do. Um, Try to make sure that they're getting, because every brain injury case should have something that is objective. So it's not just an invisible injury case. So trying to make sure, for example, that, you know, 20 years ago it was spec scans for me. You know, and then 10 years ago I was doing PET scans. And now I'm doing a lot of DTI, diffuse tensor imaging. But always something objective um, so that that way it changes the whole nature of the case. And it's not... You know, one lawyer with his neuropsychologist and his neurologist saying brain injury, and then you have one defense lawyer and her neurologist and her neuropsychologist saying no brain injury, and the jury's looking at this and saying, well, the experts are saying, you know, two totally different things, and they kind of cancel each other out because these are long, tiring, exhausting, complicated trials. Yeah. And, and who is the burden of proof? We do. So that's why a lot of these cases get no cause. So I really believe it's a difference maker, and every good brain injury case should have some kind of positive diagnostic imaging. I agree with that 100%. And just so our listeners, because not everyone does brain injury work, what is diffusion tensor imaging? So DTI is it's, it's basically an MRI um, that looks at um, basically how... how it, the, the analogy would be, imagine um, an electrical arm and your brain is the power plant. And you want to see if the signals are getting from the power plant, which is your brain, to their intended destination. And by, by what the DTI does, it looks at the axon, the, and basically the electrical lines that those messages are being conducted down to see if it's getting to its destination. And what DTI can show you is whether or not there are, let's say, those electrical lines are working. So the analogy that, that I've used from a lot of focus groups is imagine a drinking straw. And if that straw has a big hole in it, it doesn't matter how hard you're, you're, you're trying to take a drink, it's not going to end up in your mouth. And, and that's kind of what a DTI does. It looks at whether the electrical system in your brain is working and sending messages to where it's intended. So, um, but, you know, there's, there's, there's PET, positron emission tomography. There's lots of different things you can do. EEG, um, I, I'm not a huge fan of neuroquant, but there's, there's lots of different alternatives out there that you can explore, just something to take it out of the realm of, of competing experts. What I've seen is really interesting is we've had it where, you know, like a local doctor is looking and is not a brain injury neuro, neuroradiologist, or even if they are, they're not really, they don't know what they're looking for. Right. So they'll read an MRI as normal. And then diffusion tensor imaging will be done and it will show, you know, axonal loss in a certain area. Then when you go back and look again closely at that area of just the regular MRI and you, you start adjusting the contrast and stuff, you find these little white spots that don't belong there at the gray-white junction that just got missed that actually showed up on a regular MRI. I'm so glad you said that because most lawyers who think they have normal MRIs actually don't have normal <laughs> MRIs. What, it's a huge problem because most MRIs are done in, in hospitals and they've got radiologists who are very, you know, they're used to reading for things like stroke. 
they're not used to reading for things like diffuse axonal injury. And it's amazing how many normal MRIs, the, the injury is there to be seen, and it's completely missed because the hospital radiologist is not reading for trauma. So you always want to make sure that you're getting all the films to a, a radiologist, a neuroradiologist, who can review it all because, obviously, if you have a, a positive MRI very early on, that changes the whole nature of the case. And if you have, uh, I found two schools. There, there are some radiologists that uh, have enough humility that you will go back and you show them and say, you know, I did miss that. You know, is this one of these things you're looking at a million slides if no one's pointing out to you what to look for, it's easy to miss things. And some other people have such a huge ego that they, they say, well, who knows what that is, so I, didn't, I don't call that stuff. It yeah. just depends on, on the personality of the radiologist. But about half the time, we've been able to go back and talk to that person at the hospital, and they'll say, well, yeah, there is something there. All right, and, and again, that's, that's a credit to you because I'm also a huge believer in face-to-face -face meetings with doctors. And, and I always tell my lawyers, magic happens when you can take the time sit with a doctor and just review the file with them. It's amazing what you can learn. Or, you know, that, that orthopedic doctor who, you know, has very unhelpful, you know, one-sentence chart notes, you sit down and talk to them, and all of a sudden they start telling you, oh, yeah, he'll probably need a new replacement again, and then he'll probably need another one. And all of a sudden this case became a multimillion-dollar case because you spent a little bit of time meeting with the doctor face-to-face. -face. But if you do meet with them, take the time. And it's something that's so simple, but... Let's face it, most lawyers do not take the time. They do not meet with doctors, um, but it can change the case. And, and just because it informs you through their eyes of, of what's really there that you wouldn't otherwise know from the medical records. So you, you know, we've talked a little bit about how you, you, know, you make sure your clients are going to the doctor and getting the referrals they need to make sure they see the right doctors and they get the medical workup, they get the radiology and of course then you as a lawyer have to go and learn the medical literature yes uh, so that you can actually get this stuff through your fry or dauber or whatever your standard is in your state uh, and get in front of a jury but that's only part you know at the end of the day if someone has okay you have some neurons that aren't working your brain so what what right. what what is it what is the functional loss that you have what is the effect on your life what do you do to find that out and, and share that with the jury so I'll tell you a quick story because I, I learned this the hard way so um, I was really lucky and in, in my first I think 15 trials, even though they were horrible, horrible trials, I won them all. Uh, they, are, they are like the softest of soft tissue cases. Because you know, when I was a baby lawyer, it, and, and by the way, the one thing I would tell a baby lawyer is don't have any ego. You know, it's okay. If you lose, you're expected to lose. You go out there and you try and get as much trial experience as you can. You try as many cases as you can. But for whatever reason, and I, I think looking back now, I was probably more lucky than good because these were not <laughs> such great cases. But... Um, one of my first 15, first case I lost was my best case ever. And it was um, a guy who had a moderate brain injury, diagnosed in the hospital with a moderate brain injury. And maybe because it was the first like, real s substantial injury case I ever had, I went overboard on the medical. And I spent so much time on what moderate brain injury is and, and spending so much time on the medicine and I lost track of being able to show the most important thing, which is why does this matter and why should a jury care? Yeah. And in that case, my client was, um, he, he basically he cut lawns. He was a lawnmower man, you know, and his life consisted before the crash of, you know, he, he'd cut lawns, he'd come back home, he'd, he'd basically drink beer and watch TV. And then after the crash, he basically cut lawns and <laughs> came home and drank beer and watched TV. And I say this not because, because the problem was with me. And, and this is one of those things where I wish I could have had a do-over because I never was able at the time, because I just didn't realize at the time, how important it is to show a difference in, in that person's life between before the crash and after the crash. And there would have been ways to do it. You know, if I had that case today, you know, I've hired psycho, uh, psychodramatists, to go to my client's house for eight hours and meet with them. And, you know, I make sure every case I always have at least, and this is the key to winning TBI and, and most other cases too, that I have at least six great before and after witnesses and that I really can show in substantial, meaningful ways how, that, how their lives are different. And in that case, the first case I ever lost with my best injury, I never did that. I just, I made the case all about the medicine and I didn't make it about the human. 
And, you know, I now have gone on to speak about brain injury at you know, probably 100 different seminars over the years. And, and one of the, the key takeaways I try to give my, my lawyers that I, when, I, when I talk to them is um, these cases should be more about the human and less about the medicine. The exact opposite of, of what I, I did with that case. And that takes time. And, and frankly, it's, it's, lawyers don't like to do it because it means spending a lot of time with your clients really getting in their shoes, really trying to find witnesses who are not related by blood or, you know, right. or friendship, but really um, quick witnesses who can make, tell meaningful, important stories to highlight the brain injury. And that's how you win these cases. So that takes time. Yeah, we, at our initial client meeting, we asked them to start with a list, getting us a list of 10 people that can talk about what their life was before. And then one of our things on our monthly client calls is to ask, Okay, we have these people. Is there anybody else? Correct. And we, we try to get, and we actually we we just did a bunch of client videos, and part of it is explaining to them why we need this because they you know they're resistant sometimes. And uh, but I just do not believe you can win one of these cases without that. And the other thing is that if you have a brain injured person with memory problems with personality problems, they they don't even realize when they act out. Sometimes they don't realize that they forgot something. They don't, uh, you know. So sometimes they're not the most reliable historians. We even found that it's a problem with life care planners because we get an MD life care planner, but then, you know, they'll, at least, meet with, history, they'll right? at least meet with them. And so we finally found somebody that will go to the house and talk to the other family members uh, and get a better feel for it. It's going to cost more money. Uh, and, it's but, money well spent. But because, you know, it's just I've seen these life care plans. I'm like, how in the world, this guy, I mean, I know this guy. He's so messed up. How in the world is he going to, have like two psychology visits a month and no one at the house to help the wife take care of them. There's no way. Well, if, if you start with the fact that most brain injuries have a, a frontal lobe component and one of the classic problems with a frontal lobe injury is disinhibition and not being able to be fully aware of the problems that you're having, um, then you're right. You can't just rely on your client to be the only historian and to, and to based upon what they're telling you, um, drive strategy for that case. Plus, if the client can go testify and give like a really articulate description, of everything's wrong with them. They probably don't have that great of a brain injury. Well, all right. So well, maybe not. I mean, it's it's one problem we have. It's like if your client can go there and talk about all the details of their memory loss and how well, bad is yes. their memory loss. Well, well, so but but this is something to consider at least. What you have to remember with most brain injuries um, is that I always there's a these are quantitative. Injuries. These are not qualitative injuries. By that I mean most people with a, a mild to moderate brain injury, they're going to look good. Yeah. They're going to talk well. And for a one-hour deposition or for the time they're on the witness stand, the problem is a jury's going to probably not see them looking so impaired. That's qualitatively during very short periods of time. But that's not real life, is it? And, and the challenge for us is to show the quantitative effect of the injury, that how these people, even though they might look good for an hour or two here or there, they might perform well at a very short IME exam, how they break down over time, how they're not capable of handling a competitive employment at 40 hours a week. And for example, for me, I've done a lot of uh, fatigue testing, vocational testing in real life situations that lets you see over the course of several days how they break down. And you can test this. In the field of industrial psychology, which a lot of good voc experts will use and rely upon, you can put them in, in real-world situations to show that even though they might look good qualitatively, in, in real life, they're, they're not able to function. So the analogy is always, if you've got a computer and you've got 20 screens running all at the same time and 20 different programs running at once, that's using a lot of processing power. And that's what's going on with our clients who have brain injuries. And they might be able to do it, but guess what's going to happen? That computer is going to start slowing down, and then it's going to start crashing. And that's what happens to our clients. And, and there are things that lawyers can do, like, for example, uh, vocational rehabilitation testing, using things like fatigue, uh, fatigability testing. Um, what it really is called in most states is called a universal work skills evaluation. Another thing I'd like to talk to you about, because you're so good with the client services, if a client legitimately has a TBI which means they have memory loss, which means they have sometimes the frontal lobe, the disinhibition, the uh, aggressivity, or the lack of impulse control. They're challenging clients to have. 
Uh, and sometimes we found we've identified a potential TBI because someone is like someone at the office like I can't handle this client. They're such jerks. Why do we want to represent this person? And then we start talking to the family. And we found that they weren't like this before the wreck, and they're like, "Yeah, he's been horrible." And then you start that work up, and all of a sudden you have a DTI that shows all these massive axonal losses. And but it, it is a challenge to keep those people happy and to uh, give them the service they need. You know, and, and putting up with. The client saying, well, you never called me back. Oh, yes, I did. I called you back at this time and stuff. But let's go talk about it again. Uh, what, what have you done? You know, there's, there's no real secrets. Um, you, you really need to spend the time, establish trust, establish rapport. And um, I, I do believe in going to visit them at their homes. Um, I believe in you better make sure with a TBI client you're calling them back that day or at the very least the next morning. And so, for example, my secretary knows that if I'm in court or if I'm in trial, she's calling that client. And this is a little thing, but it, it, it's amazing how it, it solves little problems from becoming big problems. And she says, you know, Steve knows you called today, and he apologizes. He really wants to call you back, but he's in court. And is it okay if he calls you back tomorrow at 10 a.m.? It'll be his first phone call. And it's amazing how that can diffuse a situation um, whereas if they don't hear from my secretary and they don't know that I'm, I'm, I'm aware you know, they, they start, they, it's easier for them to fly off the handle. Um, so you need, you just need to invest the time. And, and you know, one thing that I, I do believe also is um, I believe in breaking down barriers between lawyer and client. Um, most lawyers, uh, a fundamental mistake they make in their marketing and also that affects their client is they, they, they create barriers. They're behind these big wooden desks. They don't sit next to their client at the deposition. They, they wear suits and ties that, honestly, for a lot of people who come from maybe more humble backgrounds, it's not a sign of authority. It's, it's, a, it's intimidating for them. You know, I, I laugh when I see these lawyers on their websites and they're not smiling. You know, because just a welcoming, warm smile, when people are kind of afraid of picking up the phone and calling a lawyer, makes a big difference. So most of us have these have these pictures of us, you know, not scowling necessarily, but certainly not smiling with our arms folded. <laughs> and we're sending exactly the wrong message to people if we want them to call us. Yeah. So, you know, just, you know, going to visit them in the home, having dinner with them, um, trying to establish a relationship and a rapport is so critical. And if you do that, you really don't have problems with clients. You know, even the ones with clinical depression, they know that, that you care and, and they trust you. And I don't have the problems that most lawyers have because of that. Now, what have you had to do anything on, on case selection and docket size to be able to provide this kind of service? Yes. Um, I keep having to hire lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you're also so, not taking cases you would have taken five years ago. So, yeah, you're right. You know, and... and so a couple things. One is um, I make sure, for example, if I'm going to be the quote Michigan lawyer for a lot of my friends who live out of state, that even if I can't take the case, I'm making sure they know that I'm going to connect them with a lawyer that can. And I want to be the Michigan conduit so that if they're calling me about something that's you know, a criminal lawyer, well, they know I don't do criminal, but I'll find them a criminal lawyer because I want to be the one they call. So... You know, I let my friends know that I don't take anymore, and my office doesn't take, minimum 20,000 policy limit cases. And the reason is, at the end of the day, I always joke around, but, like, my, my kid's babysitter makes more on, the, on an hourly rate than I do if I'm, you know, if my lawyers are litigating that, that 20,000 policy limit case, and then we have to pay a referral fee at the end of it. But I want those lawyers to call me still. So what we'll do is, if we can't take that case... I make sure they know that I am connecting them with a lawyer that they can trust, who will pay a referral fee, and will be thankful to get that 20000 policy limit case. So it's not just serving your clients, it's serving your referral attorneys as well. But also having, you know, for me it was so, I finally took, a, Mike Leeserman gave me the courage. I had lunch with him at a, one of these events, and, it, you know, I was asking him how he got to only handling big cases, and he said, well, I stopped taking the ones that weren't big. And, uh, and I always had an auto docket, and it was so scary for me. Because uh, even though I was working, I mean, I didn't work on myself anymore, 
I was just afraid if I didn't take the little auto cases, I wouldn't get the other cases. Right. But it has really been the best decision I ever made. But it's just having the courage to say no to things and, you know, said, look, and really, you know, every hour I spent on one of those cases was an hour I was not spending on one of my big cases. And, you know, just having that conversation with my referring lawyer, it's like, look, I need to spend my time. You know, you've entrusted me with this big case, and I need to spend my time on that. If I, if I take this case as well, it's going to detract from that one, and there's someone else that can do a great job on that. Right, right. No, there's, there's no way around it. You need to, because the, the classic mistake lawyers make is they think, well, I'll take this lousy case because maybe one day, 10 years from now, a family member is going to get hit by a bus, and they're going to remember, and they're going to call me. And they don't. They, they call the TV advertiser or, or whatever else, and you're just stuck with that lousy case. And what I found, even with the referring lawyers, is when you take lousy, you think, okay, I'm going to take a lousy case because I want to, I want to build. It's going to be my loss leader. I want to build the relationship. Well, in your, in that person's mind, you've been categorized as I am the l- lousy case lawyer, and if I have a lousy case, I can pawn it off on this guy. And the same lawyers, when I said no to lousy cases, they started giving me good cases because like, oh, I didn't realize you were doing these big cases. I thought you did these lousy cases. Is that funny? Is that funny? <laughs> yeah. So you know, so it's it's, but you know, you have to you have to make sure you're doing an investigation. Because, obviously, these days, a lot of these, quote, smaller cases may be multi-million dollar cases. Um, in Michigan, you know, we see so many, especially in out-county areas, people with very large under-insurance policies. You, you need to look at these cases. And, you know, I always think of the example of, um, you know, I have a friend in Florida who had a, what looked like a $10,000 death case and got the cell phone records, and you're, you're the expert on that, <laughs> Uh, showed that he was in the course and scope of his employment. He was on the phone with his employer at the time he killed this person, added the employer to the lawsuit, and settled for $10 million instead of 10000 So, you know, I, you, you still need to look at the case and, and work them up, but uh, the reality is if you're just handling those smaller cases, you're at, you're at the mercy of the defense attorneys because they know that the there's a ceiling on value. They're going to work it to the hilt so they can bill their money. Um, and everyone's getting paid but you. <laughs> yeah. So, Steve, before we wrap up, I wanted to ask about one other thing. You know, we talk about the you know, how we deal with the TBI clients, but then we have staff, too, that are interacting with them all the time. How do you train your staff? It's, it's always a process, and you're never done. So, you know, for my lawyers and my staff, uh, we, we bring in a lot of people to talk to us. Um, a lot of doctors come in at Lunch and Learns and, and talk with our, our entire staff. Um, I also, you know, I'm spending every year well over $100,000 sending my lawyers to seminars all over the country because I really believe in continuing education. So, you know, they're, they're not cheap, but I think the most penny-wise, pound-foolish thing you could do is not invest in your lawyers. And, you know, we're at AAJ right now. I'll tell you, every baby lawyer should go to um, the AAJ's deposition college as a young lawyer. It's going to change the way you, you practice and take depositions. Um, but, you know, none of this stuff is intuitive. It all has to be learned. And, again, that's something that you as the firm leader have, have to make sure you're aware of and you have to train your staff. Um, I make sure that we are having constant training and that, that as a team... It's not just the lead attorney and the associate and the paralegal and the secretary. It's all of them together need to understand how important it is to to be patient, to not get upset, to not make comments when someone with a brain injury has called four days in a row because that is corrosive and it is destructive to culture and it's going to change people's attitude and how how they relate to that client. And if I hear a secretary, for example... You know, making a comment like, oh, again, this is the third day that, that, you know, Tom's called. He's driving me crazy. You have to nip that in the bud and you have to be able to explain, you know, we are in a business where, where we are trying to really help people who desperately need our help. A lot of them have serious injuries and they're not fully aware of what they're doing. And you have to be patient. And if you've got people on your team, as Jim Collins says, you, you want to get the right people on the bus and the wrong people off that bus as quickly as possible. So, you know, there are a lot of cliches, hire slow, fire fast, but it is really important that I have everyone in my office, and I'll pay for it. I, I will pay the additional premium to have really good people, but I make sure they know that, that you have to be patient and the client has to come first. And, um, 
it's amazing, you know, especially like a legal secretary that comes from an insurance defense firm, how jaded and cynical they are and the way they will treat your clients. Yeah. If you don't catch it early, and, and I have fired more than my share in the first week, just saying this is not how we talk to our clients and I'm not going to let that happen because I don't want it spreading throughout my law firm like a disease. And, and if you do that, the messaging from the top is how important this is. And, and I really believe, again, you know, at the end of the day, when it's all said and done, we are one law firm out of hundreds and hundreds of law firms competing for the same clients, chasing the same cases in a shrinking pie of available cases. And what are you doing to set yourself apart? And it has to start with service and results. Kind of close it up. All these systems, all the work you've put in over the years, has that had an effect on you being able to have a life and not having to work 80 hours a week anymore? <laughs> yes, it has. Um, Tell me about that. So I am now in my second year in a row of where I'm going to take eight weeks off this summer. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, so um, it wasn't that long ago, like I said, where I was, I was humping 250 cases and I was working 80 plus hours a week. I think three years ago, I had four trials that year. And, you know, it, it was unhealthy. I mean, I was carrying around an extra 35 pounds. Um, I had high blood pressure. And I, I kind of realized this is not long-term sustainable. So I, I've made decisions to work on my practice, not only in my practice. And, you know, the reality is last summer I took eight weeks off for the first time. Not only did the world not fall apart, but it was our best year ever. Wow. Um, and, 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 but again, so you have to have the systems in place. So I make sure I have a COO who is fantastic that this has helped me train and I have a great office manager. So I do have systems in place because to be honest, I want to work on the best cases in my office. I don't want to have to deal with one secretary was, you know, mean to another secretary at lunch. I, I, I'm sorry. My, my head will explode if I have to deal with that kind of thing. I don't like HR. Um, I believe in culture, but I have people in place to deal with the culture of one secretary being mean to another. I, so I can work on the things that, that, are, that are going to pay the light bills at the end of the day. But, but you have to have the systems in place, and it can't just be you. And it's great to hear that there is that you know, light at the end of the tunnel, that you know, after doing all that hard work, you get to the point where you actually can take the time off, go, go to the beach house with the family for multiple weeks at a time. Well, life is short, and we are, we're dumb enough to be in a profession where, unfortunately, you know, there is a pound of flesh that most lawyers will pay. And normally it's, it's their health, it's their marriage, it's kids that they have strange relationships with, and, and you have to treat your, your family as the most important client you have, and you have to treat your health critically important because you blink your eyes, and let's face it, you know, this, this is a tough profession. And there are not a lot of older trial lawyers because of the stresses and pressures involved. You know, listen, I've tried, God, I, I've lost track of how many cases I've tried. I still won't sleep for a month, and I still drop 10 pounds every time I'm in trial. Well, so, I gained 10 pounds every time I'm in trial, so I'd, rather, I'd trade with you. Well, yeah, I, mean, yeah I, was, I was pretty lean that, that year I, I had uh, four trials, but, but you gotta, you got to take care of your, yourself. And, and um, if, you, if you can take the time, that first year that I said, I'm going to cut way back on my cases, and I'm going to work on my office for a year, so that three, four years from now, I can have the freedom to do this. That's, that's why I'm able to do it now. It's because of the hard work I did three, four, or five years ago to set this up today. It's not something that happens overnight, but it's something that you can plan for so that you can have a long-term, sustainable, healthy career and enjoy what you do. Steve, I wish we can keep talking, but uh, you and I both, unfortunately, we're at a convention. We have other people we have to go meet with. Uh, but if someone wants to get a hold of you, how do they reach out to you? Um, probably the easiest is my, my website, uh, which is michiganautolaw.com. Um, and I'm always happy to talk to people if they have questions or, or, you know, they can shoot me an email. Okay. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us today on Trial Lawyer Nation. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Steve Gersten. I always like talking to Steve when we see each other at conferences around the country, and I'm so happy that he agreed to come on the show and share his insights. 
Thanks for tuning in, and I look forward to having you with us next time on Trial Lawyer Nation. Each year, the law firm of Cowan Rodriguez Peacock pays millions of dollars in co-counsel fees to attorneys nationwide. Are you an attorney with a catastrophic injury or wrongful death case you'd like to discuss with host Michael Cowan? If so, you can reach Michael by calling 210-941-1301 or send an email to michael at cowanlaw.com. We look forward to talking with you again soon as we continue to explore powerful insights from our amazing host and remarkable guests here on Trial Lawyer Nation. Until then, please be sure to subscribe and review this podcast on iTunes or your favorite listening app so we can continue to reach more listeners. Visit us at www.triallawyernation.com to send us a message, listen to previous podcasts, or learn more about Michael Cowan and our guests. This podcast has been hosted by Michael Cowan and is not intended to, nor does it create the attorney-client privilege between our hosts, guests, or contributors and any listener for any reason. Content from the podcast is not to be interpreted as legal advice. All thoughts and opinions expressed herein are only those from which they came.